The ideology of Nazism did not plan to let a woman out of the triangle children kitchen church. There was even a union of German girls, where all purebred German women learned to be excellent wives and mothers. To do this, they studied cooking, methods of competent household management, home accounting, engaged in sports, but even exercises for them were selected solely taking into account their future motherhood. Their favorite entertainment was picnics and hiking, where they cooked over a campfire during each halt. This was supposed to develop in the girls all the qualities necessary for a future hostess, who would cook from anything and anywhere. A soft, pliable, caring and respectful mother to her husband and the state. Is not the ideal of a woman? At least from the point of view of the state. However, an exceptionally rigid system of education has made these women not only excellent housewives, but also beings who know neither pity nor compassion. History knows female wardens as those who ruthlessly did their job, enjoying the very process of punishing prisoners, women just like themselves. How did it happen that German women entered the system of work of concentration camps, and what punishment did they suffer for this in the future? The protracted war forced a different look at some gender attitudes, making it clear that the Fuhrer was in a hurry, writing off women. If earlier there were mass dismissals of women from positions and a call to stay at home, have children and cook porridge, then two years later, the concept suddenly changed. By 1945, 37,000 men and 3,500 women worked in the system. Documents of the same years state that women made up about 10% of the total number of people employed in the military sphere. As a rule, they were employed in lower positions, but the level of wages and a sense of belonging to something bigger than the kitchen made these jobs desirable. The same category also included wardens, the need for which arose already in 1937, when the first women's concentration camp appeared. The more women's camps there were, the more wardens were needed. Men could not work as guards in women's camps. According to the Nazi concept, this would be extremely immoral. Yes, the camp commander, guards, and doctors were men, but they had the right to enter the camp premises only together with female guards. It is not entirely clear who was more afraid of German morality, female depravity or male weakness, and how could the matron prevent this? In the famous Auschwitz, most of the workers were men. There were 8,000 of them, 200 women. Of these, the highest position occupied by a woman is the senior supervisor. Her duties included organizational work, control over the rest of the female supervisors. It was the senior warden who decided what punishment a particular prisoner deserved. The head of the camp did not delve into such nuances. The senior matron was subordinate to the first matron, her right hand. There were also the heads of the block. They were responsible for the daily construction. The wardens were the lowest link in this hierarchical system. The guards had to keep order not only for the prisoners, but also in the vaults, in the kitchen, in the punishment cell. The overseers who distributed the workers stand apart. It was they who decided who and where, for what type of work should go. Everyone could become a matron since such work did not require special skills. But the salary was quite high. There was an opportunity to take paid processing. In addition, the guards were given uniforms, up to underwear, and if the work was particularly diligent, and the worker had a penchant for this type of work, then she could count on a promotion up to the head of the camp. There were enough willing. That's just the special inclination, meant a woman's willingness to be immune to other people's suffering but simply cruel and inhuman. The future employees of the camps had to be physically developed, have no administrative and criminal penalties in the past, and be party supporters. Age restrictions from 21 to 45 years. Of course, the inspectors were interested in the origin of the applicants. Preference was given to the Germans. The recruitment of girls was carried out through the employment service. Besides, the certificate indicated that the work would require some physical effort and consists in security activities. However, there were more camps, and the need for wardens began to grow. The real recruitment and commitment began. 
special four-week courses were organized, after which it was necessary to work in a concentration camp. The course was a short excursion into the basics of the work of the camp system, after which it was necessary to work out a three-month probationary period and then to register as a warden. When applying for a job, they were notified that good treatment of prisoners was seriously punished. It was forbidden to address by name, but the wardens could just find fault with the prisoners, mock them at their own discretion. Weapons were also allowed to be used in case of disobedience or an attempt to escape. The supervisor could introduce her own measures to maintain disciplinary order. Usually, as punishment, they were deprived of food, sent to the punishment cell, beaten, tortured, and poisoned with dogs. Very soon, yesterday's modest and even Zatyukani women began to feel their strength and boundless power. It was only a matter of time, besides, the system to which they belonged only encouraged cruelty towards prisoners. Women lost their human face quite quickly, despite all their positive qualities that they were characterized by before. Hertha Ehlert is a warden who received a real punishment following the trial of concentration camp workers. Her story is very different from what you might have heard before. Hertha Ehlert began her career in the Ravensbrück concentration camp. Then she was transferred to another institution of a similar type. Hertha herself explained this by saying that she was transferred from camp to camp because she was too kind to the prisoners. And the transfers were carried out in order to punish her. Of course, the court did not believe her. During her career, the girl managed to work in Auschwitz and then Bergen-Belsen, where she managed to reach the position of deputy senior warden. Apparently, this position was given to her for infinite kindness and compliance. To some extent, circumstances forced her to go to such a service because before she lost her job, her life was not remembered by anything remarkable. She, as expected, was married, worked, as expected, in the service sector, according to one version, a baker, according to another, a seller. She was born in Berlin in 1905. She was registered at the Labor Exchange in 1939, at the same time she was called to the SS. During interrogations, she always insisted that she had no idea what her job would be, and time after time she called her excessive kindness the reason for her frequent transfers from one camp to another. They say that she always tried to feed the prisoners in addition, despite the prohibitions. She refused to be tortured, and they were mandatory. She was especially sorry for the prisoners with children. She carried food and medicines to them, and somehow tried to make their life easier in the barracks, tried to create better conditions. However, the testimony of Hertha herself is far from the only evidence of those times. Malvina Graf not only survived the concentration camp, but also subsequently devoted her memoirs to these years. It turns out that she was in the very camp where Hertha was working at that time. It happened in Plazau. According to the woman, Hertha was assigned to the kitchen, and in her hands was a constant whip, which now and then soared over the heads of the prisoners. She used it just masterfully. She always looked for profit in everything, often arranged searches for imprisoned women for hidden valuables. Upon detection, it was immediately withdrawn. The rest of the prisoners called Hertha one of the strictest guards, who clearly performed her duties with great pleasure. She took away any valuables from prisoners, those who were not too compliant and obedient, locked them in the basement, whipped them, and did not give them food. Malvina Graft also claims that Hertha Ehlert worked in Plazau until the end of the war and was one of the participants in the death march when the Red Army began the liberation of Poland. For the Germans, such an attack was extremely unexpected. They began to collect prisoners from the camps and transport them to other camps. Women and children were taken out of Plashoff first. Prisoners were driven from camp to camp for twelve days on foot, without food and rest. Those who stopped were shot. The losses of prisoners during the death march were simply catastrophic. It was not for nothing that he was nicknamed that way. The fascists chose to kill the prisoners rather than leave them to the Liberation Army. Alert got into another book, this time by her presence in Auschwitz. 
The author William Hitchcock also has memories of a warden who beat prisoners with particular pleasure, and her name was Hertha Ehlert. Too many negative memories for the kindest matron, isn't it? Also, according to the testimony of concentration camp prisoners, Hertha Ehlert had strange inclinations. She was noticed more than once as she spied on prisoners in the shower. She also enjoyed watching the imprisoned girls working in brothels. Hertha Ehlert explained her strange behavior at the trial by saying that these were her duties. Who exactly forced her to monitor the intimate affairs of concentration camp prisoners? She did not say. Gert was arrested by the British military, and in the autumn of 1945 she appeared in court. The Belson trial has gone down in history as a triumph of justice and injustice at the same time. On the one hand, justice has triumphed, because yesterday's wardens were brought before the court and they had to answer to the whole world for their crimes. On the other hand, many of them received a much shorter sentence than they deserved. However, this show trial was the beginning of many other courts that handed down harsh and fair sentences to yesterday's Nazis and their accomplices. Hertha Ehlert was listed at number eight at the trial. Next to her were other wardens with whom she had worked in recent years. Some of them received the highest penalty, execution. This process, which lasted exactly two months, was followed by the whole world. It was then that for the first time it became known about all the horrors that were happening in the concentration camps. These horrors were witnessed by the prisoners themselves, who miraculously survived. It is not surprising that they were waiting for retribution and did not hide anything. A total of 45 defendants participated in the trial. Among them were 16 camp staff and SS men. 13 prisoners who were among the privileged and actively cooperated with the camp authorities. All of them were arrested by the British during the liberation of the concentration camps, but many of those arrested did not live to see the trial. Others escaped. The first anti-Nazi trial was organized clumsily, with a lot of flaws and mistakes. It became indicative of all subsequent trials of the Nazis, in which previous mistakes were already taken into account. In subsequent court sessions, the Nazis and their accomplices were accused of crimes against humanity, while the Belsen court considered exclusively war crimes. The trial was organized by the British and took place according to the English norms of judicial procedure. In other words, it was adversarial. It even gave the Nazis a head start. The defendants had defenders who actually defended them. Sharp questions to witnesses appealing facts and other methods that were supposed to reduce the guilt of the defendants, all this took place during the hearing of the case. Despite such efforts, capital punishment has become the most popular form of punishment in the course of this process. But the heroine of our issue, Hertha Ehlert, or the kindest warden, escaped the death penalty. She was sentenced to 15 years in prison, and this is despite the fact that all her attempts to appear innocent were in vain. She was transferred from camp to camp, not as a punishment for kindness, but quite the opposite. It was rather a promotion, an improvement in working conditions for the excellent fulfillment of their official obligations. She never admitted her guilt after the trial, and after being released, she changed her surname because she was afraid of revenge from former prisoners. Herta Ehlert did not even finish her sentence. She was released ahead of schedule in 1953. After that, she lived a long life and lived comfortably, needing nothing, died at the age of 92, receiving a pension from the state. Many supervisors have grown old in full confidence that they were only doing their job, what the state demanded of them, and therefore there is nothing to blame them for. And conscience? Conscience probably turns off when the monstrous crimes happening around are committed with such frequency that they become something ordinary. Thanks a lot for watching, friends. If you liked this video, then please like and subscribe to my channel. See you soon.